everyone. My name is Dr. Sam Ward, and I'm an assistant professor of insect ecology at Mississippi State University in Starkville. And today I'm going to give you a short presentation titled Insects and Trees. So as the title of my talk would suggest, I work on insect pests of trees. So that includes things like uh, wood borers and bark beetles that can attack the stems or trunks of trees, and also things like caterpillars that chew on the, the leaves or foliage of trees and can cause problems that way. Now there are lots of beneficial insects, including lots of ben beneficial insects that interact with trees like pollinators. Uh, it just so happens that I work on the ones that tend to cause problems, what we would call pests. And I tend to think about the problems uh, that insects cause on a very global scale. So I've indicated where we're recording this video from, which is Starkville, Mississippi, located in the southeastern part of the United States. And I'm going to use this map to describe some of the types of things that I work on. Let's consider a hypothetical insect that currently and historically lives in Europe. We would say that that insect is native to Europe. However, some insects have been able to travel to places in which they don't naturally occur and have been able to establish reproducing populations in those new, often faraway locations. So if our hypothetical insect was able to make this journey to the USA and establish here, we would refer to this insect as a non-native species. So you might be thinking, wait a minute, that's a really long distance for an insect to travel, and they would have to either fly, jump, or swim across the Atlantic Ocean in order to get here. So it leads to the question, how do insects actually make and survive such a difficult journey? And the answer is, unfortunately, us. So humans, often unknowingly or by accident, lend insects a hand. For example, someone planning to travel from Europe to the United States might buy some fruit before they leave. That fruit might be infested with some insects and the traveler might not be aware of it. So they might pack that fruit into their luggage, board a plane, and then land in the United States later that same day. So if those hitchhiking insects survive that short journey, they could potentially leave that piece of fruit after they arrive and start their new life in the United States. Another very common way by which insects can arrive in the US is through international trade. So here's a picture of a huge cargo ship at sea. And if you look closely at this picture, you can see lots and lots of shipping containers. So insects can hitchhike on the outside as well as on the inside of these containers and get moved really, really long distances in the process. And lastly, importing live plants from areas outside of the United States can also lead to non-native insects arriving here. So many people love the idea of planting a beautiful Japanese maple tree in their yard, but unfortunately, if we aren't careful, live plants can be infested and can serve as a frequent source of non-native species. So I'm going to zoom in here on the United States. And I've outlined the state boundaries of Mississippi here in red. And in Mississippi, we have lots and lots of ecosystems that are important to our state. So lots of farmland like soybean and lots of pine plantations. And when we have non-native species show up here and start causing problems, uh, it can be really detrimental, really harmful uh, to the people that own, work, and rely on this land. And so a very real world example of this happening uh, is emerald ash borer. So emerald ash borer is native to Asia, and it showed up in the United States in the early 2000s. Um, and as far as we know, it made this journey uh, within one of those shipping containers on a cargo ship. So here's the adult stage of emerald ash borer. As far as insects go, it's a medium-sized insect. So it's about a half inch. Uh, this is a, a real photo, a, a photo that is to scale of emerald ash borer on a penny. And in the adult stage, uh, emerald ash borer is this beautiful metallic green color. When they spread their wing coverings or their elytra here, they have a very pretty metallic purple color on the top side of their abdomens. So I've showed you the adult stage of emerald ash borer, which is pictured here in the middle of this circle. But emerald ash borer starts its life cycle as an egg. So an individual larva will hatch from an egg. That larva will develop into a pupa and eventually into an adult. 
And so the adult stage and the egg stage both occur outside of an ash tree, but the larval stage and the pupal stage both occur inside of an ash tree. So what that looks like, here we have some eggs that have been laid. Again, an individual larva will hatch from an egg and begin to tunnel inside of an ash tree. So as the name suggests, emerald ash borer can cause problems for ash trees. And we have several species of ash trees that are native to the United States. And we have several individual ash trees in the state of Mississippi. So I've showed you a cartoon graphic of this, and this is what it looks like in reality. So here we have an individual larva. And here's the outside of the bark over here, the outside of the ash tree. And then this is inside the ash tree on the left-hand side of this photo. So those carvings, those S-shaped carvings on the left side of the photo are feeding damage from larvae. And the stuff that looks like sawdust is actually insect poop or what uh, entomologists, people that study insects, call frass. So frass is just a, a fancy name for insect poop, but essentially what these larvae are doing are uh, chewing up the plant tissue and then pooping it out as frass. And when you have lots and lots of these insects, it can cause serious problems for an ash tree. So here's a, here's a picture of that on the left. Lots and lots of feeding damage from lots and lots of larvae. And this tree has uh, been fed on so extensively that the bark has dried and cracked and fallen off the tree, except for this little piece right here. And if you were to take a step back and look up at this tree, uh, you would see that it is not able to grow any new leaves or foliage um, and that it is in fact, unfortunately, dead due to this attack from emerald ash borer. So given that emerald ash borer can cause this kind of damage to our native ash trees, there's a lot of interest in where this insect occurs in the United States. And as far as the South, emerald ash borer occurs in every single state that borders Mississippi. But thankfully, to date, we have not detected this insect inside our state boundaries. But because we know that it occurs in a neighboring state, uh, as a researcher, I have a lot of interest in knowing, well, if it occurs in Arkansas, how long will it take emerald ash borer to get from the Mississippi-Arkansas border uh, to where I live in Starkville, Mississippi? And so to answer this question, we use something called an insect flight mill. So this is the insect flight mill pictured here. This is emerald ash borer glued to a tether arm, which is just a copper wire. That copper wire is glued to a number one insect pin. That insect pin goes through an encoder wheel. And that encoder wheel uh, with the insect pin is all held in place through two magnets. And so if this emerald ash borer that's attached to the flight mill, opens its wings and begins to, to beat them, it would end up rotating this entire flight mill, and we would be able to measure how many times the insect flies around in a circle using this recording device, which we could then turn in to an estimate of how far this insect can fly. So I'll give you an example of what that looks like here with a short video. So here, there's an emerald ash borer attached to each flight mill. So the reason those flight mills are spinning are from a emerald ash borer that is beating its wings and making that flight mill spin around and round in circles. And it looks kind of blurry here because the insect is flying so fast. We'll get a still shot here in a second. And you'll be able to see potentially a bit of this purplish color, which is on the insect's abdomen. And in the background, you can see here is the body of an emerald ash borer, and here are the elytra up in the air. And so it's this insect that is beating its wings and making that flight mill spin, which we can then, like I've said, turn that into an estimate for how far these insects can fly. So to tell you how far these insects can fly, I'll use a football field for reference. So if you include the end zones, a football field is about 120 yards in length. And we found that within less than a day, emerald ash borer can fly two thirds of a mile or about 10 football fields, which if you ask me is a pretty far distance for an insect 
that can fit on a penny. So we could fit dozens and dozens of these things in the palm of our hand, but they can fly several football fields, over 10 of them in a single day. So if we go back to our question of how long would it take an emerald ash borer to get from that Arkansas Mississippi border over to Mississippi State? Well, if they flew in a straight line and they found plenty of food and water along the way in order to keep their energy up, it would take emerald ash borers, at least the average emerald ash borers, six months to make it from the border to Mississippi State University, which is good news. But the fastest flyers that we observed in the lab, they'd be able to make it that distance in about a month. The good news is, is that emerald ash borers rarely fly in a straight line or as fast as they can. These are insects that tend to hang out in the same neighborhood or same area in which they were born. So by means of their own flight, they're not gonna travel super far distances. However, because emerald ash borer spends part of its life cycle inside the host tree, if a host tree gets cut down and it's infested and it gets used as firewood, emerald ash borer can travel as far as that firewood gets moved, as can other wood boring insects that live inside trees. So be very careful that if you are using firewood this summer for camping, that you burn it uh, in the same vicinity of where you buy it. Because however far you move that firewood, you could be moving non-native species along with it. So with that, I'd like to thank you for tuning in today. Here's my contact information. You, if you have any questions about uh, something I covered in the presentation or any of the stuff that we work on here at Mississippi State.